Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In nearly all cultures, myths and legends can serve as cautionary tales, keeping one foot in practical reality and the other in the realm of the supernatural. And it's no surprise that the most effective cautionary tales are also the scariest. The ancient lore of the indigenous peoples of North America are as varied and far-reaching as the continent itself, and unless you're well-versed in native lore, you might not realize how many of those tales are populated by horrifying spirits, ghosts, witches, demons, and monsters. And since I'm in the scare business, I'm here to share some of the most nightmarish. We'll look at Native American legends, myths, lore, and monsters that span multiple tribes, and in some cases, hundreds of generations. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! This is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode of Weird Darkness… Native American people in Oklahoma tell of a vampire-like creature called Stikini or Man-Owl. The Native American Iroquois are terrified of a flying demonic creature that takes pleasure in tormenting their people, just for kicks. Native Americans have wonderful legends of a powerful and magnificent thunderbird that was sent by the gods to protect humans from evil, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't terrifying. The Hopi Indians encountered what they called the Massaw a living skeleton that was not only horrifying, but also gifted the Hopi with sacred knowledge. Many native myths and legends deal with coyotes. For some, it is the most sacred of all animals. For others, it is the most profane. Did the Comanche Indians defeat a race of white, red-haired giants? The Illini people have had numerous encounters with a mysterious dragon-like creature that existed thousands of moons before the Paleface came. The Cherokee have an interesting tale of how disease and medicine came into existence, and the story also explains why Native Americans respect all life. The Cherokee also talk of an ancient light-skinned people whose blue eyes were so sensitive to light that they lived in the dark, underground. The Chumash Indians in California first spoke of the Dark Watchers in legends, and their artists painted images of them on cave walls. Who or what were they? Native Americans in North America have a well-known cryptid that's believed to live even today. It's cannibalistic, it can shapeshift, and it's called the Wendigo. All cultures have tales of heroes defeating evil. The Algonquin tribe is no different, and their mythical hero defeated evil sorcerers and the sorcerer's demon followers. That and a whole lot more Native American lore. So bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. In ancient folklore of the Seminole Indians of Oklahoma in the United States, there is a vampire-like creature called a stakini, or man-owl. Likewise, terrifying stakini legends are widespread among the Creek people. Originally, the stakini were believed to be malevolent witches who transformed themselves into undead, huge, owl-like monsters. Technically dead, but constantly reanimated 
they could spend their nights seeking human hearts to consume. Hearing the terrifying cry of a stakini is an omen of impending death. Many Native Americans who know the stakini stories avoid mentioning this bizarre creature openly. Usually, only certain medicine people tell about the stakini without putting someone at risk for turning into one. By day, stakini appear as an ordinary human, but at night, the stakini make terrible things. It vomits up all its internal organs and hangs them in a tree or hides them somewhere else to prevent animals from eating them. Then it can change its appearance into a great horned owl. In this disguise, it flies out in search of a sleeping person to prey upon. It removes the still-beating heart from its victim by pulling it out of his mouth, and then it takes the heart back to its home. It cooks the heart in an enchanted pot and eats it in secret. The stakini needs to consume one human heart each night, while, for example, Jiangji, a Chinese hopping vampire, kills living creatures to absorb their qi life force, according to Chinese legends. Before dawn, the stakini returns to its hidden organs and swallows them, and then it looks again as an ordinary human being. Ancient people believed that there may be a way to get rid of the creature, but it is very difficult. At first, a person has to find its organs hidden by the stakini while the creature is still hunting, and then destroy it before dawn, which guarantees the death of the monster. Sunlight is also disastrous for the creature stakini, who has not turned back into human shape. This can be done with some specially chosen arrows, which are decorated with owl feathers, then ritually blessed and dressed with sacred herbs. When the stakini returns to consume its organs, one can fire upon it with the magic arrow, as this is the only time that the creature is vulnerable. Stakini is a dangerous shapeshifter with the ability to transform into any animal it wants, but it prefers to perform as an owl. By day, it takes on the form of a human in disguise. It undergoes a physical or perhaps even mental transformation. It lives its daily life as a human, socializing with the community and mimicking the human's behavior perfectly without ever being exposed. The creature's true origin is camouflaged and there's no way to reveal it. The Stakini folklore is rather widespread and popular among natives of America. Though the shape-shifting evil creature originates in Seminole lands, over the years, many legends and stories about Stakini have circulated in swampy regions of New Jersey and Michigan. The Iroquois have an interesting legend about a horrifying flying head that terrorized people for no apparent reason. This was no ordinary head of a normal person. The head was huge, about four times larger than the size of a man. This bodiless creature had great wings protruding from its cheeks. Lurking in the forest, the monster was coated in thick, black hair, and its mouth was filled with fangs. It ate everything that was alive, including humans. What is interesting and slightly unusual about this Native American monster is that it seems to have vanished into thin air. The flying head was seen by many, but then it simply disappeared, and no one knows what happened to it. The story of the flying head of the Iroquois is different than most other flying creatures of Native American lore because there are very few sightings of this dangerous creature. Legends tell one day a man spotted the flying head soaring through treetops. It seemed to be nothing more than a shadow, but it was glowing brightly. He hurried back to the village and told everyone to leave as fast as they could, and everyone left, except for one woman who stayed there with her baby. The woman sat beside the hearth and built the fire up into a great blaze, then heated some stones to a red-hot glow. Suddenly, the flying head appeared, its horrible mouth slavering as it looked into the longhouse from the far end. Not giving any sign that she noticed it, the young woman began to pretend she was eating a meal. 
She picked up the red-hot rocks with a forked stick and pretended to put them in her mouth, and with each bite she said how great it tasted, what wonderful meat it was. The monster watched, growing hungrier and hungrier, his horrid mouth drooling until he could wait no longer. He stuck his head far into the longhouse and swallowed the entire heap of burning rocks. A horrible scream pierced the night, and another, and the monster frantically beat its wings and flew off into the dark, screaming in agony and rage. He screamed so loud, the trees that he flew past all trembled. People scattered here and there in the forest and fell to the ground, covering their ears. The monster kept screaming as he flew further and further away from the longhouse until his screams could be heard no longer, and the people rose up from the ground and went home finally safe. The origin of the flying head remains a mystery. Some think the head belongs to a murder victim. According to other Native American beliefs, a human is transformed into a flying head after committing an act of cannibalism. According to both Iroquois and Wyandotte mythology, flying heads are ravenous spirits that are cursed with an insatiable hunger. Sometimes flying heads are also associated with whirlwinds, As previously mentioned, the flying head that terrorized the Iroquois came and vanished without a trace. What happened is unknown. Some think it died, though that is unlikely if it was a true spirit. Another option is that it is still alive, and some of the Iroquois think that it went to the sea. Perhaps it is now hunting creatures that reside underwater. Native Americans have wonderful legends of a powerful and magnificent thunderbird that was sent by the gods to protect humans from evil. When this huge eagle-like bird soared the skies, one could hear its mighty wings beat with the sound of rolling thunder. Its eyes were burning like fire and caused lightning. The thunderbird was no ordinary bird. It was the spirit of the storm and a supernatural creature that was just as much feared as admired. Often described as a shapeshifter, it lived in a cloud above the highest peak the tribe could see or in a cave in the mountains. Various tribes tell slightly different stories about the Thunderbird, but all Indians feared the bird and tried not to anger it. Winnebago Indians of the northern Midwest and Plains states believed that the Thunderbird possessed supernatural powers. The Thunderbird was a shapeshifter and could take the form of humans. Interestingly, the legendary falcon warrior or birdman is a common motif in Mississippi culture. It has been depicted with a beaked face on unearthed artifacts from Cahokia to Georgia. In some traditions, birdman is interpreted as a version of Redhorn, another heroic figure whose twin sons fought off a race of giants. Experts believe that Birdman was a warrior king, but it's also possible that this was a legendary Thunderbird. According to Winnebago Indians, the Thunderbird was able to manipulate weather, affecting the winds and creating storms, lightning, thunder, and rain. There were not just one Thunderbird, but many of them were often seen in the skies. The Thunderbirds were enemies, with the water spirits and the giant birds used their lightning when crossing the waters to protect them from the water spirits. The Passamaquoddy Indians, who live in northeastern North America, primarily in Maine and New Brunswick, have legends that confirm the Thunderbirds were shapeshifters. According to the Passamaquoddy, the Thunderbirds were men who could transform themselves into flying creatures. Their legend tells that Thunderbird is an Indian and he or his lightning would never harm another Indian. But Wachowson, the great bird from the south, tried hard to rival Thunderbird. So, Passamaquoddy's feared Wachowson, whose wings Glooskap once had broken because he used too much power. In Native American mythology, Glooskap is a mythical hero who defeated evil sorcerers and demon followers. We'll look closer at this character later on in this episode. The Quileute Indians of the Pacific Northwest remember how the Thunderbird was sent by the Great Spirit to help the Indians after a horrible disaster. The Indians had no food, 
and many had died after rain and hail had fallen for many days, destroying all plants. After the rain came snow, and the Indians called the Great Spirit for help, and it then sent the people the Thunderbird. The story of the Thunderbird's arrival is described in detail in the book Indian Legends of the Pacific Northwest, written by Ella E. Clark. The people waited. No one spoke. There was nothing but silence and darkness. Suddenly there came a great noise and flashes of lightning cut the darkness. A deep whirring sound like giant wings beating came from the place of the setting sun. All of the people turned to gaze toward the sky above the ocean as a huge bird-shaped creature flew toward them. The bird was larger than any they had ever seen. Its wings from tip to tip were twice as long as a war canoe. It had a huge, curving beak, and its eyes glowed like fire. The people saw that its great claws held a living, giant whale. In silence, they watched while the Thunderbird, for so the bird was named by everyone, carefully lowered the whale to the ground before them. Thunderbird then flew high in the sky and went back to the thunder and lightning from which it had come. Perhaps it flew back to its perch in the hunting grounds of the Great Spirit. Thunderbird and Whale saved the Quileute from dying. The people knew that the Great Spirit had heard their prayer. Even today, they never forget that visit from Thunderbird, never forget that it ended long days of hunger and death. For on the prairie, near their village, are big, round stones that the grandfathers say are the hardened hailstones of that storm long ago. The Thunderbird is also described as a very large bird that makes fearsome noise. Thunderbird is a very large bird with feathers as long as a canoe paddle. When he flaps his wings, he makes thunder and the great winds. When he opens and shuts his eyes, he makes lightning. In stormy weather, he flies through the skies, flapping his wings and opening and closing his eyes. Thunderbird's home is a cave in the Olympic Mountains, and he wants no one to come near. If hunters get close enough so he can smell them, he makes thunder noise and he rolls ice out of his cave. The ice rolls down the mountainside, and when it reaches a rocky place, it breaks into many pieces. The pieces rattle as they roll further down into the valley. All the hunters are so afraid of Thunderbird and his noise and rolling ice that they never stay long near his home. No one ever sleeps near his cave either. Thunderbird keeps his food in a dark hole at the edge of a big field of ice and snow. His food is the whale. Thunderbirds fly out to the ocean, catch a whale, and hurry back to the mountains to eat it. One time, a whale fought Thunderbird so hard that during the battle trees were torn up by their roots. To this day, there are no trees in Beaver Prairie because of the fight that Whale and Thunderbird had that day. One of the most interesting aspects of the legend is that the Qualiute mention the Great Flood in their description of the battle between Thunderbird and Whale. All of the above-mentioned legends describe the Thunderbird as a very large, powerful creature that makes thunder and lightning. Myths from all across the world tell of magnificent birds that were sometimes known under a variety of names among ancient cultures. Many mythological birds were believed to have had supernatural powers. Adarna, a beautiful legendary bird of the Philippines, was said to change its colors after singing seven songs. This magnificent bird could restore health, but also turn a creature into stone. The ancient Chinese have interesting stories about a nine-headed bird, Zhu Feng, one of the earliest forms of the Chinese phoenix. Mythical fiery bird phoenix is mentioned in Roman, Greek, or Egyptian mythologies. The incredible phoenix is a symbol of the sun, immortality, rebirth, resurrection, and eternal life. This mythical creature has also its counterpart in China, Japan, and India, and in each of these cultures many appearances of phoenix have been created, but all of them have similar significance. They are also all alike. Birds have always been mysterious creatures and close to the gods, and the powerful Thunderbird was one of them. Other Thunderbirds are spoken of in Northeast North America, around the state of Maine. 
Pamola is a snowbird spirit in mythology of Abenaki or Penobscot indigenous peoples. In ancient beliefs of these people, Pamola, which means he curses on the mountain, is said to be the god of thunder and the guardian of Mount Katahdin, or the greatest mountain, in the highest mountain in the U.S. state of Maine. The Thunderbird is a large avian creature, widely known and worshipped among the indigenous people of North America. This legendary bird, most commonly found in folklore of Arizona in the southwestern United States and a close relative to the phoenix, could create storms. Numerous stories tell of a gigantic bird that creates the sound of thunder by beating its huge, strong wings. Sheet lightning is said to be the bird blinking, and lightning bolts are made by glowing snakes which the bird carries around with it. The Thunderbird is often described as having horns or even teeth within its beak. The Penobscot people have their Thunderbird. The creature, known as Pomola, is described as having the body of a man, the head of a moose. In some legends, Pomola's head is as large as four horses and powerful wings and feet of an eagle. In another oral tradition, Pomola was the storm bird with powerful wings, a head as large as four horses and with horrible beak and claws. The legendary bird is associated with snow, night, wind, and storms. It was definitely not a creature any human being would want to mess with. When people heard a noise like the whistling of a powerful wind, they knew that Pomola was flying not far from them. The bird was both feared and respected by the Penobscot people. As Karaden was the adobe of Pomola, the natives avoided climbing the mountain and considered this activity as taboo. There was a belief that the spirit disliked mortals interfering from down below. As Henry David Thoreau, an American philosopher, essayist, poet, and historian who explored the mountain and the beliefs of the Penobscot Indians of Maine wrote, Pomola is always angry with those who climb to the summit of Kadadin. In Algonquin myth, the legendary bird Pomola is an evil spirit eventually conquered by Glooskap, a trickster god and a mythic hero. One story is about a man who went to the forests at the foot of the sacred mountain and was caught in a heavy snowstorm. The only thing he could do was to appease Pomola. He burned offerings of oil and fat until the god of thunder himself appeared to take the offerings. Surprisingly, Pomola was not angry and thanked the man for his respect and generosity, and took him to his sacred abode inside of Mount Kadadan, where he lived in comfort with Pomola's family. He even married Pomola's daughter, but on one condition. He was not allowed to marry anyone else, or else he would be taken prisoner inside of Mount Kadadan for good. Unfortunately, the man didn't heed the warning when he came back to his tribe. He disappeared, and no one ever saw him again. Another story tells about a woman who constantly persisted in refusing to believe even in the existence of Pomola, unless she witnessed him with her own eyes. One day she was on the shores of the Lake of Ambactictus near Mount Kadadan on the southwest side. Pomola appeared and took the woman to his home inside the mountain. She stayed with him there for a year and was well treated, but powerful Pomola made her pregnant. Then she left his abode and returned to her home carrying Pomola's son. Pomola warned her not only to never remarry but also warned her of their son's supernatural and frightening power. The child could point at any living thing with his right forefinger and it would die instantly. He advised the woman to keep their son apart from society until the age of manhood, but her fellow villagers wanted her to remarry. She refused, explaining that Pomola was her husband and in case of marriage, she and the child would be taken back to Mount Kadadan. No one took her words seriously, though, and soon she was remarried. But in the evening of her marriage day, when all the Indians from her village were gathered together celebrating the marriage, both she and her child vanished forever. The Hopi Indian's encounter with Massa was very emotional and frightening. His physical appearance was so horrifying that many of the Hopi Indians ran. 
Some of the Hopi had the courage to stay because they'd been looking for him for such a long time. They wanted to listen to Massa and receive spiritual wisdom. The remarkable encounter with Massa is one of the reasons why the Hopi are today considered keepers of sacred knowledge. The Hopi Indians have a very rich mythological tradition stretching back over centuries and have stories about their ancestral journeys through three worlds to the fourth world where the people live today. According to Hopi legends, Massa is a spirit that cannot die and he was therefore appointed to be guardian of the underworld. He is described as a skeleton man and lord of the dead in Hopi mythology. Hopi mythology tells about the existence of worlds before our own. All previous worlds were destroyed because people became disobedient and lived contrary to Tawa's plan. Tawa is the sun spirit and creator in Hopi mythology. There are different versions of how the previous worlds were destroyed and who managed to survive. Some legends tell that the third world was destroyed along with all evil people, but other stories reveal good inhabitants were simply led away from the chaos which had been created by their actions. When the Hopi emerged into the fourth world, our current world, they learned that Massa was on Earth and they went looking for him. People who wanted to escape from the third world decided to make contact with Massa. First, they sent a swift bird looking for Massa, but the bird was so tired when it reached the sky that it had to come back. Then the Hopi tried to send a dove and later a hawk, but both creatures failed to reach Massa. The one that succeeded in finding Massa was the catbird. Massa asked him, why are you here? The catbird said, the world below is infested with evil. The people want to come up here to live. They want to build their houses here and plant their corn. Massa said, Well, you see how it is in this world. There isn't any light, just grayness. I have to use fire to warm my crops and make them grow. However, I have relatives down in the third world. I gave them the secret of fire. Let them lead the people up here, and I will give them land and a place to settle. Let them come. Massa looked like a skeleton man, a stick person, and he was a fearsome sight. When the Hopi Indians accepted Massa's frightening physical appearance, his attitude began to change and he gave them wonderful knowledge. Massa explained to them how they should live and allowed their people to flourish. The guardian spirit Massa gave the Hopi permission to settle in the region that is now northwest Arizona. Massa noticed that greed, ambition, and social competition were dominating factors in their former life and this lifestyle made people very unhappy. Massa warned the Hopi that the life he had to offer them was very different from what they had before. To show them, Massa gave the people a planting stick, a bag of weeds, and a gourd of water. He handed them a small ear of blue corn and told them, here is my life and my spirit, this is what I have to give you. Massa explained that if they followed his way, they would live long and fruitful lives. He wanted them to be humble and live like he did, with only a planting stick and seeds. He wanted the Hopi to take care of and respect the land, and they did what he said, despite the fact that their manner of living was not easy. Dry farming in the high desert of northern Arizona, relying only on precipitation and runoff water, requires an almost miraculous level of faith and is sustained by hard work, prayer, and an attitude of deep humility. Following the way of Massa, the Hopi people have tended to their corn for nearly a millennium, and the corn has kept them whole. For traditional Hopis, corn is the central bond. Its essence, physically, spiritually, and symbolically, pervades their existence. According to the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, a tribal training and support organization based at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, to be Hopi is to embrace peace and cooperation, to care for the earth and all of its inhabitants, to live within the sacred balance. It is a life of reverence shared by all the good people of earth, all those in tune with their world. This manner of living lies beneath the complexities of WIMI or specialized knowledge, which can provide stability and wisdom but when misused can also foster division and strife. 
Deeper still in the lives of traditional Hopi people lies the way of Massa, a way of humility and simplicity, of forging a sacred bond between themselves and the land that sustains them. Massa's way is embodied in corn. The source of true happiness is to live in peace and harmony with nature, animals, and other people, according to Massa. The Hopi followed his teachings, and they lived peaceful in communities, caring for each other for centuries. They always carried within them the knowledge of the Great Spirit, and they performed sacred rituals daily. The word Hopi is a short version of their name, Hopitu Shinumu, or the peaceful people, or peaceful little ones. The Hopi Dictionary gives the primary meaning of the word Hopi as behaving one, one who is mannered, civilized, peaceable, polite, who adheres to the Hopi way. The tribe does live up to the name. The Hopi are a very peace-living people, and they have managed to keep their culture intact thanks to the sacred knowledge given to them by Massa, the Skeleton Man. We're not even to the halfway point of this episode. There are many, many more legends and myths from North American Indians that are fascinating and frightful, so keep listening. People often feel sad or blue once in a while. These feelings are usually short-lived, though, and don't interfere with daily life. However, clinical depression is a serious condition that affects both the mind and body, impacting more than 350 million people around the world including me. It's not simply a negative attitude or just in the imagination of the person dealing with it. It's an illness in the same way that diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are. If you're constantly struggling with feelings of hopelessness, anxiety, emptiness, thoughts of death or suicide, please check out all the resources available at ifred.org. ifred.org. It's a funny name, I know but it stands for International Foundation for Research and Education on Depression. So, IFRED for short. At IFRED.org, you can find support groups, peer-to-peer -peer support, learn about hope and other resources. As hopelessness is the only predictor of suicide and the primary symptom of depression, I'm really excited about what they're doing. Check them out for yourself or for a loved one. It's IFRED.org. That's IFRED.org. This October is the fourth anniversary of Weird Darkness, but we already have the celebratory t-shirts and other swag in the store. Looking for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, and other weirdo merchandise? Click on the Store tab at WeirdDarkness.com. Coyote the trickster god is a well-known figure in myths and legends of indigenous peoples of North America. Coyote, a mischievous, cunning, and destructive force at work within creation, was also assigned to the role of god-deceiver, a great cheater who misleads people and animals and finds obvious pleasure in causing troubles and upsets on a daily basis. Among the many tribes of Native Americans, there is a belief that Coyote is the bearer of all evil, brings winter and even death. The Maidu people of Northern California, for example, portrayed Coyote as deceitful, greedy, and reckless, and these obvious failings in his character make problems to people around him. His impulsive and foolish behavior causes him to suffer as well. Frequently he is killed through his own carelessness, but in some way, Amazingly, he always comes back to life afterwards. Still, the coyote remains a very prominent animal, and the basis of his character is the same in all myths. Only a few character traits of coyote vary from region to region. Other tribes claim the opposite and believe coyote is the teacher of wisdom, the trickling god who, when properly approached, can share with people some priceless wisdom. Many native myths deal with this amazing creature, the most sacred and at the same time most profane of animals. Coyote's power is to make people free or to feel fear. Among many Native American tribes, the coyote is credited with bringing humanity the gift of fire, the destruction of monsters, the making of waterfalls, and the teaching of useful arts to the Indians. But perhaps the most famous and fascinating incarnation of this remarkable creature 
is presented in the Nez Perces tribe's myth of Coyote and the Shadow People. His actions lead to humankind being forever separated from the spirit realm of the dead. As we look deeper in Coyote's character, we realize that the creature's cunning tricks are not always trivial ones. His mischief is not so much to deceive us from our goal, but rather to show how ridiculous we often are in our lives and suggests we have to take a bit of distance to ourselves and think about what we really do with our lives. Unlike the coyote, we cannot come back to life if we are killed. By looking at coyote's foolishness, we can avoid making mistakes and find a straight road with a purpose in our lives. Coyote is sometimes a creator, sometimes a clown, destroying things for himself and others who surround him. Because of his vanity and boastfulness, the coyote undertakes various ambitious enterprises in which he fails due to his passions. Is it not the same we experience in our lives sometimes? Coyote has been compared to both the Scandinavian Loki and also Prometheus, who shared with Coyote the trick of having stolen fire from the gods as a gift for mankind, and Anansi, the great trickster of West African legend which was originally credited with the creation of the world and became a cultural founder hero. In the Aztec pantheon of gods, there is the trickster and transformer, the old coyote, that shares many characteristics with the trickster coyote of North American tribes. In Eurasia, rather than a coyote, a fox is often featured as a trickster hero. For example, in the Japanese mythology he's known as Kitsune, and in medieval folklore of Europe there is a similar figure known as Reynard the Fox. Several legends of giant white men exist throughout Native American culture, including the northern tribe of Comanche and southern Mantenos. In the book History of the Choctaw Indians, Chickasaw and Natchez, published in 1899, Horatio Bardwell Cushman writes, the tradition of the Choctaw that has long been a race of giants inhabited what is now the state of Tennessee, beings with which their ancestors fought when migrated from the West. Its tradition states that Nahulo had an impressive stature. The Nahulo, according to Cushman, was a common term for white settlers within the United States, but its original derivation was referring to white giants. Ray Vibrante Comanche was the reigning leader of Great Plains tribes who referred to white men reaching heights of three meters and had a more dominant role in culture than even the current Caucasian or former white settler prevalence. They had many forts that dominated the landscape. Coincidentally, they would be eliminated by a much larger force, such as the Great Spirit, and Ray Vibrante dictated they actually were responsible for the societal mounds within North America. Much of this history was written down by Dr. Donald Panther Yates, a Native American historian, as follows. A majestic white race endowed mining technology giants that dominated Western North America, enslaving inferior tribes. They died or returned to heaven. In the South, Aztec myths said that the human race was developed during the Sun of Rain per the legend of the suns by the god Tlaloc, although other creation myths exist. According to this myth, the sun showed during the third cosmogonic epoch of Quetzalcoatl. The people of Teotihuacan and Tlachialotlpetl originated from the feathered serpent in Cholula, and this battle lasted until the times of the conquistadors. Pedro de Leon wrote in 1864, there are reports concerning giants in Peru who have arrived at the coast at the point of Santa Elena. The natives were dismayed to see a boat made of reeds reaching its shore with cargo of creatures so high that knee to the floor was as big as a man of great stature. His limbs were deformed in proportion to the size of their bodies, and their heads were something monstrous to do with hair hanging to his shoulders. His eyes were as large as small plates. Apparently the giants were not shy about public sexuality, and it shamed the natives, and is the explanation for their elimination from the earth by deities. The Nevada tribe, Paiuti, 
also describes white settlers brought by a red-headed giant who survived on the blood of their own. According to oral history recorded by Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins, the Paiute defeated the Saite Ka in an epic battle. Some cave findings in the area corroborate this narrative. Bones in private collections show odd features that suggest cannibalism as well as oversized artifacts like 40-centimeter sandals. Depictions of the mysterious giant Piazza bird can be found on a limestone bluff overlooking the Mississippi. Native American legend tells this creature existed long before the Pale Faces arrived on their lands. It was a bird described as one that devours men in the Illini tongue. An interesting theory suggests the Piazza bird may be related to ancient Japanese dragons. The first discovery of the Piazza bird was reported in 1673 when French-Canadian explorers Father Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet sighted a painting of the creature as they navigated the river near present-day Alton, Illinois. As we were descending the river, Marquette recorded later in his diary, we saw high rocks with hideous monsters painted on them and upon which the bravest Indian dare not look. They are as large as a calf with heads and horns like a goat their eyes are red, beard like a tiger's and face like a man's. Their tails are so long that they pass over their bodies, ending like a fish's tail. They are painted red, green, and black, and so well drawn that I could not believe they were drawn by the Indians, and for what purpose they were drawn seems to me a mystery. Measuring some 30 feet long to 12 feet high, the depictions of the Piazza bird are the largest pictoglyphs ever documented in Aboriginal America. The carvings were made on the sheer face of the cliff. Native Americans said the cliff was so steep no man could climb up to it. If Native Americans did not make the carving in the Piazza bird then, who did? The Illini Indians, near what is now Alton, Illinois, were terrified of the bird and fired arrows and bullets whenever they passed the painting. Researchers who spoke to Illini Indians learned that the Piazza bird existed in this country many thousands of moons before the arrival of the Pale Faces. Indians from Miami said something similar. According to them, the Piazza bird was present in America several thousand winters before the Pale Faces came. The Native American dragon came to the country a very long time ago. The Illini Indians say the giant bird killed not only their animals but also people and they drove it away in prehistoric times. In the 19th century, explorers reportedly found a nearby cave filled with human bones and sightings persist in the area of a giant bird. Nobuhiro Yoshida, professor of languages and president of the Japan Petrograph Society, compared the paintings of the Piazza bird with depictions of ancient Japanese dragons and found some striking similarities. According to Professor Yoshida, the Piazza bird resembles the dragon depicted by Siko Kano in the painting for the ceiling of the Hashirai Shrine at Yukahashi Fukuoka Prefecture. Both the American Piazza and the Japanese dragon have talons, are winged, bearded, horned, and are multicolored. This may naturally be a pure coincidence, but it is an interesting observation. However, unlike the murderous Piazza bird, Dragons were the objects of Japanese prayers and rituals because the creatures were personifications of drought-ending thunderstorms. We encounter dragons and dragon kings in almost every ancient culture of the world. Dragons played an important role in the beliefs of our ancestors, and these creatures were depicted in a variety of ways and are regarded as either good or fearsome evil creatures. This Cherokee tale is interesting because it relates a philosophy of life which was practiced by many Native Americans. They used every part of the animal they hunted if possible, and showed respect for the life they had to take to survive. This is not the case in most cultures. So why the difference? 
this legend may help us understand. It's the legend of the little deer. The Cherokee say that in the early days of the world, all animals and plants could talk, and people respected them, only taking what they needed to survive. If animals and plants could talk to us, perhaps that would still be true. However, a change came about when the people invented the bow and arrow. Suddenly, they could hurt with much more ease and started killing indiscriminately, reveling in their newfound power. The animals called a council to decide what to do about this terrible change in order. The bears thought that if they could use a bow and arrow as well, the humans would think twice about what they were doing. But there was a problem. The bears found they could not shoot the bow and arrow because their claws interfered. One bear decided he would cut off his claws so he could use the weapon. The strategy was effective, and he found he could aim and shoot quite well. He was very proud that he had solved the problem. But then, one of the elder bears spoke up. He asked whether the bear who had shot the bow so well could now climb a tree. The bear found he could not climb the tree without his claws, and so the idea of using the human weapon was thrown out. However, because the bears were the first to suggest harm to the humans, the hunter was not required to ask pardons for killing bears. The deer had a different idea. Awiusti, little deer, said that he would teach the humans in their dreams how to show respect for the life of that they hunted and only take what they needed. If the humans did not perform the proper rituals of respect, little deer would cause them to become diseased with rheumatism. Little Deer visited the humans in their dreams, and some paid heed to the warning, but others thought this was just an ordinary dream, not a message. Some still decided to go out and kill indiscriminately. These hunters soon found themselves stricken with illness which made their muscles weak and caused them to be unable to hunt effectively. By this, it was shown that the dream of Little Deer was a true dream and the people decided that they should observe rituals of respect for the life they took, as well as being careful to use every part of the creature whose life they had cut short. The other animals had separate meetings, and all devised terrible ailments as punishments for the disrespect humans had shown them. Only the plants decided to help the humans, as they did not feel they had been treated badly by them. The plants decided that each of them would come up with a different remedy to counter all of the diseases that the animals had invented to plague the humans. So disease came into the world, and the humans were forced to learn respect for the life that sustained them. If not for the plants, the human species would have been doomed. After that, it was said that every plant had a use, even the weeds, if only the humans could discover its valuable properties. When a doctor did not know a remedy for a disease, it was possible to find it by asking aid from the spirit of the plants. What does this philosophy say about humans? It seems that the Cherokee felt that humans were wasteful and violent creatures. The only way to make them show respect was with threats of harm, punishments, and judgments. When we look at the modern world, we might be inclined to agree. The Native Americans lived in harmony with the land and creatures upon it. Perhaps if we had all grown up with legends such as this, we would also show respect for all life. The Cherokee recall a white-skinned race that lived on their lands before they arrived. This group of very unusual beings were known as the Moon-Eyed People. Cherokee legends tell the Moon-Eyed People were of small stature and had pale, white skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. They were called Moon-Eyed because they had very sensitive eyes and were unable to see in daylight. They could, however, see very well at night. Since these mysterious ancient people were blinded by the sun, they were forced to live in underground caverns. The Moon-Eyed People were physically totally different from the Cherokee, and when these two races encountered each other, war broke out. The Moon-Eyed People were first mentioned in a 1797 book by Benjamin Smith Barton. Later documentation tells of similar accounts, such as an 1823 book, The Natural and Aboriginal History of Tennessee, which tells of a band of white people who were killed or driven out of Kentucky and West Tennessee. According to the Cherokee, 
the Moon-Eyed people lived in Appalachia until the Cherokee expelled them. The Moon-Eyed people are said to have built some ancient structures in the area. One of them is Fort Mountain in Georgia. It is an 850-foot-long zigzagging stone wall that is 12 feet thick and up to 7 feet high. The age of the wall has never been properly determined, but according to some sources, it was built around 400 to 500 AD. Who really built Fort Mountain is still a mystery. Cherokee legends tell the ancient structure was raised either by the Moonite people or Madoc, a Welsh prince who came to America in 1170. Former Tennessee Governor John Sevier wrote that the Cherokee leader, Okanastota, told him in 1783 that local mounds had been built by white people who were pushed from the area by the ascendant Cherokee. According to Sevier, Okanastota confirmed that these were Welsh from across the ocean. The identity of the Moon-Eyed people is unknown. Who were these mysterious, small, pale beings who lived underground? One theory suggests these people were of Welsh origin, being descendants of Maddox colonists. An ancient structure almost identical to the Fort Mountain can be found near DeSoto Falls, Alabama. It's possible it was built by these Welsh settlers after they left Fort Mountain. There are two Cherokee legends that could shed some light on this ancient mystery. One legend reveals that the Cherokee defeated the Moon-Eyed people and drove them from their homeland during a full moon. Another version tells the Cherokee chased the Moon-Eyed people away from their home at Hiawassee, a village near what is now Murphy, North Carolina, west into Tennessee. According to both Cherokee legends, the Moon-Eyed people went underground. That's all we know. The Moon-Eyed people and their fate remains an unsolved ancient mystery. After all this time, we may never find out what happened to the white-skinned race because the truth lies buried somewhere in antiquity and may never be unearthed. Nevertheless, the legend of the Moon-Eyed people and their encounter with the Cherokee is truly fascinating. Who or what the Dark Watchers are, no one knows. Where these elusive beings came from and where they go remains a mystery. They leave without a footprint. They are mentioned in a number of ancient legends and are well known in several U.S. states. The Dark Watchers are apparently giant, human-like phantoms that are only seen at twilight, standing silhouetted against the night sky along the ridges and peaks of the mountain range. When spotted, the beings are usually seen staring off into the open air of the mountains, seemingly at nothing in particular, before vanishing into thin air occasionally right before the spectator's eyes. In their book, In Search of the Dark Watchers, authors Thomas Steinbeck and Benjamin Brode write that the Romans coined the original term, and in ancient times this spirit was envisaged as an actual creature a guardian animal or supernatural being such as an elf, a fairy, or ghost. How far away from this original idea are the Dark Watchers? Over time, beliefs of literal spirits were discarded, and less supernatural concepts have prevailed. In modern times, there are some people who say they have encountered a Dark Watcher, but what these giant beings are looking for or watching is beyond anyone's current comprehension. There are no scientific explanations, only speculations. In the book Weird California, it is said the Chumash Indians first spoke of them in legends and their cave painters drew of them in their colorful wall drawings. Later, legendary author John Steinbeck described them in his short story Flight. Pepe looked up to the top of the next dry, withered ridge. He saw a dark form against the sky, a man's figure standing on top of a rock and he glanced away quickly not to appear curious. When a moment later he looked up again, the figure was gone. Also in 1937, the poet Robinson Jeffers mentioned them in his poem, Such Counsels You Gave to Me, as forms that look human but certainly are not human. If Jeffers or Steinbeck ever actually saw one of the Watchers is unknown. 
but the local legend has been around since long before they wrote about it. In the mid-60s, a Monterey Peninsula local who was the first principal of a local high school saw them while hiking in the mountains. He had enough time to study the dark figure, to see its clothing, and notice how the figure was strangely studying the mountains. When the principal called out to his fellow hikers, the figure disappeared. Other more recent sightings have included a dark hat and cape in the description of the mountain residing phantoms. The Dark Watchers are sometimes also referred to as the Old Ones. They predate the coming of the white man in America, and all Native American tribes have stories about them. It is said that Spanish explorers encountered these enigmatic beings and several Mexican soldiers also reported seeing them. The origin and identity of these mysterious beings remain an unexplained ancient mystery that baffles us until this day. This next section is something I have shared in the podcast before, but with this episode's sole focus being on Native American myths and legends, I just couldn't leave it out. In some myths of the Algonquin tribes of North America, there is a mythological creature, Wendigo, that takes different forms. It is a cannibal, a monster. When there is nothing left to eat, it starves to death. When it sees something, it wants to own it. No one else can have anything. This illness feeds on a spiritual void. The Wendigo is a danger that surrounds us. It is not only a creature from myths and legends of the ancients. The Algonquin Native Americans represent the most extensive and numerous North American groups, with hundreds of tribes speaking several related dialects of the language group Algonquian. They lived in most of the Canadian territory, below the Hudson Bay and between the Atlantic Ocean and the Rocky Mountains. Their rich mythology, and their beliefs survived many generations, and so did the Wendigo, a monster and boogeyman. This cannibal monster, also known as Windigo or Wingigo, is an evil man-eating spirit. However, his abilities and evil doings vary depending on the locality where the legends were gathered. Generally, the Wendigo has certain characteristics of a human or an evil spirit. By possessing a human being, the Wendigo can change his or her form to become a cannibal. The Wendigo, a malevolent, supernatural being, is associated with cannibalism, murder, and voracious greed, and this kind of behavior has always been condemned in these indigenous communities. In some myths and legends of the Algonquin-speaking peoples, those who commit sins such as selfishness, greed, or cannibalism are turned into a Wendigo as punishment. Among the peoples of Canada, around the Barrens Lake, located in Manitoba, Canada, along the eastern shore of Lake Winnipeg, the Wendigo is an amphibious being, like an alligator, with bear's feet or cloven hooves. In the beliefs of the Chippewa Indians, also known as the Ojibwe, the evil creature is an ogre, which is focused on children to obtain their compliant behavior. Along with other indigenous tribes, such as Eastern Cree, West Main Swampy Cree, Noscopy, and Innu, the Ojibwe describe the Wendigo as a giant many times larger than human beings. In Algonquin folklore, however, the Wendigo is the spirit of a lost hunter who now mercilessly preys upon humans in a cannibalistic manner. The Wendigo is never happy. He is never satisfied with his killings and consuming of the bodies. He is constantly searching for new victims his hunger is limitless. As I said, when there is nothing left to eat, it starves to death. When it sees something, it wants to own it. No one else can have anything. This illness feeds on a spiritual void. It is not only a creature from myths and legends of the ancients. The Wendigo is a danger that surrounds all of us. Numerous mythical stories explain Earth's creation and how it came to be. Among the Algonquin folktales and traditional stories, which belong to 35 different Native American tribes from Long Island to California, there is one myth about Glooskap, also known as Gluskabi, 
a trickster god, a mythic hero who, according to some myths, made the whole world from the body of his own mother. It is said that Glooskap came from the east, though he had the form of a man. He taught the Indians all that they know, everything from the names of the stars to how to hunt and fish, and it's portrayed in most stories as a wise man. His brother, Malsum, a wolf god, was also a creator god, but according to the Algonquins he was responsible for creating all the evil things of this world that threatened and infuriated human beings. Glooskap was considered the protector of humankind, while Malsum was constantly trying to harm people. However, Glooskap could get very angry at those who did not follow his advices. According to one Algonquin story, a young man goes to Glooskap asking for help in finding a wife. The man is ugly and has been avoided by hundreds of women whom he would asked to be his wife. Glooskap gives him a small parcel, with instructions not to open the package until he gets home. Though the man's friends beg him not to open it on the way home, the man simply cannot resist his curiosity. He opens the package, and hundreds of beautiful young women fly out in all directions and bury the man beneath their weight. His cries for help are in vain, and moments later he is crushed into the earth. The next morning all the women have vanished, and all that's left are the remains of the young man's crushed bones lying on the ground. Glooskap also had no mercy for those who asked him for immortality. He simply turned them into rocks or trees, though in general he is a benevolent deity who will grant most reasonable requests. In one version of this creation story, Glooskap's brother Malsum killed him with the feather of an owl, the only thing that can harm Glooskap. But the great benevolent hero returned to life and killed evil Malsum with a fern, so Malsum became an evil wolf, Lux. Still, Glooskap had to defeat evil sorcerers, Kuwakwa and Metasolan, Malsum's demon followers who tried to avenge their leader's death. The legend has it that Glooskap finally defeated the forces of evil, and when this was done, he gave a great feast for all the animals on the shores of Lake Minas and then sailed off in his canoe. The animals, who had previously all spoken the same language, discovered that each species spoke a different language once he had gone. Glooskap is sometimes depicted as a rabbit, though it is said that he, as a shapeshifter, can take whatever shape he wants. He is expected to return as a savior of his people when they are most in need. When Weird Darkness returns, we'll look at a few more legends and myths of Native Americans. Plus, we'll step into the Chamber of Comments, where I'll reply to some emails and comments that you've left me over the last few days. Want to receive the commercial-free version of Weird Darkness every day? For just $5 per month, you can become a patron at WeirdDarkness.com. You also get bonus audio, news about the podcast, and more. Click on Become a Patron at WeirdDarkness.com. There are so many legends and myths from Native American culture, and while I would never be able to touch on all of them, here are a final few that I think deserve a mention. Adasaya According to the Zuni people of southwestern United States, Adasaya is a cannibalistic giant demon, depicted as several times larger than a human, with his torso described as being as big as a large elk. Anasaya possesses long gray hair as prickly as porcupine quills, skin so thick the knuckles appear horned, muscular arms covered in black and white scales, and a swollen red face in which his bulging eyes never blink. A minority of stories also claim Anasaya has long yellow tusks and long talons. An unsavory figure in native mythology, Anasaya is regarded as an incorrigible liar in addition to being a cannibal of both humans and his fellow demons. Habitually armed, Adesaya is routinely depicted with a giant flint axe or a flint knife as broad as a man's thigh and twice as long. 
appearing throughout numerous Zuni legends of similar composition in Edesaya the Cannibal Demon, the monster deceives two young maidens and lures them back to his lair. After failing to persuade them to eat a soup made from human children or to comb his hair, the women are rescued by the Zuni war gods who slay the demon. In another story, The Rabbit Huntress and Her Adventures, a young woman lost in a blizzard seeks refuge in a cave. Discovered by Anasaya, he attempts to break into the cave, but again the war gods rescue the maiden and defeat the monster. Kamazots, the Death Bat This ferocious creature originates with the ancient Mayans, who depicted him as a powerful god monster from the hellish domain of Zybalba, where he presides over swarms of bloodthirsty vampire bats. Though powerful enough to destroy entire civilizations, Kemazots made a treaty with human beings to bring them fire, but in exchange, he demanded human sacrifices. In other words, there are evil forces lurking everywhere, so you'd better do your homework. The Ogapoga or Nitaka The Ogapoga, also known as Nitaka, translated as water demon, is a lake monster who, according to Canadian folklore, lives in Okanagan Lake, British Columbia. Most commonly described as measuring between 40 and 50 feet in length, the sea serpent resembles the extinct Mosasaurus, a carnivorous aquatic lizard from the Cretaceous period. As with the flathead lake monster, numerous sightings of the Ogopoga have been claimed in recent decades, including at Okanagan Mission Beach in 1946 and on film in 1968, although subsequent video analysis proved the creature to have been a mere waterfowl or beaver. According to the legends of the First Nations, the Ogopoga would demand a toll from travelers in exchange for safe passage near its home of Rattlesnake Island in Lake Okanagan, using his tail to create a mighty storm for those who refused and leaving the shoreline strewn with the remains of those who sought to cheat him. The toll required by Ogopoga was that of life, and so when natives ventured into the lake they would often bring small animals, such as chickens, to drown in the lake and appease the monster. In local legend, Tim Baskett, a visiting chief from a neighboring tribe, declared his disbelief in the existence of Ogapoga. Scorning the sacrifices of his guests to the demon as he returned across Lake Okanagan, Tim Baskett refused and his canoe was sucked under, killing himself and his entire family. Local history also tells of non-Indians who ignored warnings, notably a settler in 1854 called John McDougall. Whilst crossing with a team of horses, McDougall's canoe began to be dragged below the water. Remembering the advice of natives, McDougall cut the ropes holding the horses on board. The horses were pulled under and drowned, but McDougall was spared. Chainu, the Ice Giant Though some tales describe the Chainu as a Bigfoot-like creature, the original legend from the Wabanaki people tells that he was once a human, but at some point committed a horrible crime, for which the gods cursed him and turned his heart to ice. His frozen spirit was then trapped within the body of a lumbering, troll-like monster who devours any human he can get his hands on. Mishipeshu, the Water Panther the story of the Water Panther spans multiple tribes, including Cree, Algonquin, Ojibwe, and Shawnee. It's usually described as a giant, dragon-like feline, and the most common element is the monster's aquatic habitat. It lurks in lakes and rivers, waiting for humans to come close to the water, then pulls them under and drowns them. The Kachi Tuasku, also known as the Stiff-Legged Bear, was an enormous man-eating monster with a large head that allegedly preyed on native people through eastern North America. Approximately the size of an elephant, with the Penobscot Indians of modern-day Maine detailing the creature's inability to sleep lying down due to giant inflexible legs, it is widely assumed that the monster originated from early mastodon remains discovered by natives and incorporated into existing oral histories and mythologies. The Kachituasku serves as a general figure of wider native folklore, with several other tribal cultures retaining belief in a similar monster. The Iroquois people feared the naked bear, as great man-eating creatures with the form of a bear but no fur and an oversized head. 
The beast was near invincible to ordinary human attacks and could only be wounded in the soles of their feet. Likewise, the Lenape, Shawnee, and Algonquin tribes told legends of the Yakwawiak, gigantic, stiff-legged, hairless bears comparable to mammoths or mastodons, whilst among the tales of the Alabama and Coasati peoples existed a huge carnivorous predator known as Atipa Tacoba, described as bear-like in appearance. Yidaldushi, the Skinwalker A skinwalker is a witch who, according to Navajo folklore, has, among other powers, the ability to turn into and disguise themselves as an animal. The animals most commonly associated with skinwalkers are those culturally identified as tricksters, notably the coyote, but can also include those reflective of death and darkness, such as wolves or owls. According to Navajo legend, to become a skinwalker requires the willful murder of a close relative, and as such they are both feared and reviled within native mythology. Representing the antithesis of the supposed cultural ideals of the Navajo and their medicine men, that of healing and helpfulness, skinwalkers choose to instead manipulate spiritual magic to do evil deeds in a perversion against nature. In addition to their powers of physical transformation, skinwalkers can also possess the bodies of animals and people by locking eyes with them. Due to their presumed power, skinwalkers are prevalent beings in Navajo folktales. These stories typically take the form of climatic struggles between great persons of the tribe and the witch, although atypically for native folklore not always with an exclusively positive outcome, and often included a didactic message for children to learn from. Many victory stories involving skinwalkers conclude with multiple inhabitants of a hogan, the traditional Navajo dwelling, joining together in a communal strength of wills to scare away the monster and the darkness it brings with it. The Cutacamooch, or Ghost Witch One of the scariest figures in the Passamaquoddy and Micmac mythology, the Ghost Witch is often said to be born from the dead body of a shaman who practiced black magic. The demonic entity then emerges each night with murder on its mind. They can be killed with fire, but beware if approaching one. Simply making eye contact or hearing the witch's voice can bring a diabolical curse down on the unwary. The Perverted Merman Dedamkinawet, also known as the Perverted Merman, is a creature which recurrently appears in Algonquin mythology, specifically that of the Abenaki people. Described as half-man and half-fish with a childlike human face, Nadamkinowet lives in streams and lakes where women regularly wash themselves. Unlike other native monsters, Ndamkinowet does not seek to harm these women or to scare them, merely to voyeuristically watch them. Some traditional stories do include attempted molestation, but for the most part, the perverted merman is just that, a pervert. Mermaid-like creatures are a staple within Native American mythology, with several Algonquin tales including characters who disobey their parents being turned into similar creatures. Consistent throughout these depictions in Native legend, the theft of a merman's or mermaid's clothing strips the being of their magical powers and renders them unable to swim. Tataklea, also known as Lakuza, the Owl Women from the Yakama tribe come tales of five supernatural women who resemble giant owls, dwelling in caves by day and flying out at night to prey on all manner of creatures, including humans. In fact, they are said to prefer the taste of children. Legend has it that they can hunt humans by mimicking their language. Tahihan The Tahihan, deriving from the Arapaho word for strong, are a race of cannibalistic dwarves with allegedly superhuman strength. Although descriptions vary, the Taihian are generally depicted as the size of children, with dark skin, and said to have an extremely aggressive and unsociable disposition. According to some legends, they possessed the ability to become invisible, while others contend they merely seemed so due to the incredible speed with which they caught their adult prey. Within native folklore, it is widely agreed that the Taihian were destroyed in an ancient conflict in which the Arapahos and other Native American tribes allied to successfully defeat them. 
A unique aspect of their characters, it is suggested in some tales that the Taiyan had the ability to remove their hearts and store them for safekeeping, in so doing protecting themselves from physical harm to their persons. One such prominent story within native folklore tells of a warrior captured by a family of Taiyan and who, to delay his death, asks his dim-witted captors about the macabre organs adorning their residence. Upon learning their true nature, the warrior stabs each of the hanging hearts, killing each member of the Taiyan family and winning his freedom. Along with the Taiyan, there are numerous other evil dwarf-like creatures in various indigenous American cultures. The Nimeriger, or People Eaters, are a race of dwarves belonging to Crow and Shozon legend, said to reside in the Wind River and Pedro Mountain ranges of modern-day Wyoming. Described as aggressive by nature, they shoot poisoned arrows and kill their own kind should they fall ill with a blow to the head. During his famed expedition, Meriwether Lewis claimed to have seen evidence of the Devols, describing them as roughly 18 inches tall and highly ferocious. Although originally believed to have been entirely mythical, the 1932 discovery of the San Pedro Mountains mummy, a 14-inch tall mummy, has brought this into question with tests demonstrating the individual was approximately 65 years old at the time of death and violently killed by an inflicted head wound. Since 1932, several other similar bodies have been recovered across North America, lending credence to a 1778 account suggesting the existence of a pygmy burial ground and the possible historical existence of people akin to the Nemirigar. Not isolated solely to the Nemirigar, Crow folklore also includes the Nerumbi, a race of goblin-like creatures, estimated to be between one and two feet in height with sharp teeth and very little neck, the Nerumbi are considered enemies by the native peoples. Depicted as often engaging themselves in harmless mischief, the Nerumbi are also considered responsible for evil acts such as child abduction and the killing of livestock. Similarly, the Pukwudgies, or Person of the Wilderness, of Algonquin folklore are a knee-high race of little people. Considered by some tribes, including the Ojibwe, to be harmless spirits of the forest, other tribes such as the Abenaki believe the Pukwudgies to be dangerous foes, with a predisposition toward the theft of children and possessing powers similar to those of the magical skinwalkers. Utenka, the Horned Serpent The Horned Serpent Utenka of the Cherokee people is a mythological monster that recurs throughout several Native American oral histories, especially in the Great Lakes and southeastern woodlands regions. Described as being as large as a tree trunk and covered in magical scales with horns and a gemstone on its forehead, the horned serpent could not be harmed except in a single spot on its head. Whilst its breath was poisonous, to slay the monster would win the warrior a crystal of immense power granting a life of successful hunting, rainmaking, and romance. According to Cherokee legend, a great warrior named Agananitsi achieved this feat, wherein he discovered the crystal required a sacrifice of blood each week. Without this tribute, the crystal searches for blood itself, becoming a ball of fire and murdering those it encounters. Other variants of the horned serpent include the tie snake in Muscogee Creek traditions, slightly smaller than the horned serpent and likewise covered with crystalline scales with a large gem in its forehead, the snake was considered capable of prophecy and its horns were believed to carry medicinal powers. Unlike the Yoktena, the tie snake was not considered to be evil or willfully harmful to humans. Equally, the Alabama people told stories of a crawfish snake of a similar design and purpose. In contrast, traditional Sioux belief claimed these serpents were dangerous water monsters of the ancient world, but had been destroyed by the Thunderbirds, supernatural beings of great power, and only their lesser ancestors, such as lizards and snakes, have survived. It is theorized this mythological belief stemmed from the discovery of dinosaur fossils by the Sioux and the Thunderbirds from pterosaur skeletons. The Flathead Monster The Flathead Lake Monster which I mentioned very briefly earlier in this episode, originating from Kootenai traditions, is a creature that supposedly dwells in Flathead Lake, Montana. 
The creature is typically described as an enormous eel-shaped animal with a body akin to that of a snake, measuring between 20 to 40 feet in length, blue-black skin, and gray-black eyes. According to the tribe's legend, the first inhabitants of the region lived on an island in the middle of Flathead Lake. On one winter day, whilst crossing the frozen lake, two girls saw antlers sticking through the ice and, believing they belonged to a drowned animal, decided to cut them off. After cutting into the two-foot-long antlers, the ice split open to reveal the monster, the awakening of whom caused the drowning of half the residents of the lake. This explanation is often provided in folklore for the small number of Kutunai people. Similar to the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland, modern reports of the Flathead Lake Monster are abundant in the local area, including a claim in 1889 by Captain James Kerr, 13 such reports in 1993, and an alleged rescue of a three-year-old drowning boy by the monster. The creature was taken sufficiently seriously that in the 1950s a significant reward was offered for the capture of this super fish, but despite numerous efforts, no firm evidence of existence has ever been recovered. Two-Face Existing among the Sioux Plains and Omaha tribes, Two-Face, also known as Sharp Elbows, is a two-faced monster who enjoys preying upon native populations, torturing and gruesomely disfiguring his victims before murdering them. As typically depicted in folklore, all who gaze upon either of the twin visages of Two-Face become paralyzed with fear, or in some cases die instantly, and he utilizes his extremely sharp elbows to stab his frozen victims to death. As with several Native American monsters, Two-Face is widely considered to retain a preference for children and female victims, especially pregnant women. According to Lakota mythology, Two-Face was once a woman who was turned into the creature as punishment for attempting to seduce the sun god, with one beautiful face and one hideous. An alternative origin story includes a similar background, albeit with Two-Face being born from such an adulterous woman. This duality, as with several native stories seeking to impart a didactic lesson, is widely regarded as representing a disconnection from and disharmony with nature as an allegorical advocation of traditional conformity within the tribe. Washuga A Washuga, similar but not identical to a Wendigo, is a cannibalistic monster stemming from the stories of the Athabascan people of northwestern Canada. According to legend, the Washuga is a person who has become possessed or overpowered by the spirit of a great animal, in so doing, devolving into a giant, bestial form. Some versions of the Washuga depict the creature as being physically made from ancient ice come to life to hunt humans, invulnerable to harm, and only defeated when melted over a campfire. This rendition of the Washuga is notably similar to that of the Wabanaki's Chinu, an ice giant who was cursed by the gods for his crimes, his heart turned to ice, and his spirit trapped inside a troll-like monster that feasts upon humans. Described as giant animals, both intelligent and physically powerful, the Washuga hunts humans and attempts to ensnare and devour its prey through cunning deception. As with the Wendigo, certain tribes adhere to a less spiritual origin of the creature, but instead a product of human indulgence in taboos resulting in the physical corruption of the depraved individual. The Danza of the Peace River region in western Canada, for instance, contend that a Washuga is the product of breaking a strong cultural taboo, such as having a photograph taken with flash, listening to guitar music, or eating meat with fly eggs in it. The Underwater Panthers The Mishibizu, also known as the Underwater Panther or Great Lynx, is a legendary creature belonging to the mythologies of native inhabitants of the Great Lakes region of North America. A monster from the underworld, the panther resides in creeks and rivers, hiding in wait to drown unsuspecting prey. Described by the Sioux as possessing a body shaped like a buffalo, albeit with paws allowing for rapid swimming, the underwater panther has just one eye, horns, either a single horn in the center of its forehead or a pair, dorsal fins, a spiked tail, and is covered in scales. Because of the latter characteristics, it has been speculated that the underwater panther is in fact derived from a prehistoric stegosaurus. 
feared by the Ojibwa as the cause of waves, whirlpools, and rapids, it was considered within tribal folklore that each lake might be inhabited by its own underwater panther, which controlled the lake's conditions. Despite being mortal enemies of the Thunderbirds, some native communities revered the creatures as symbols of great power and hunting prowess, whilst at least one tribe fearlessly employed the underwater panther as part of a children's game similar to tag. According to an ancient Chippewa tale, the underwater panther lived on an island of mud situated between two lakeside villages. Avoided by locals for fear of an evil spirit, two girls crossing one day encountered the monster. Cutting off the beast's tail with a wooden oar, the severed limb transformed into a solid piece of copper and became a talisman for good luck in fishing and hunting for their tribe. We'll step inside the Chamber of Comments in just a moment, but if you made it this far, you can count yourself as part of the Weirdo family. If you like this episode, please share it with your friends and family on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, and your other social media, or message them and tell them to give the podcast a listen. Do you have a dark tale to tell of your own? Click on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com and I might use it in a future episode. Also on the website, you can find the Weirdos Facebook group, paranormal and horror audiobooks that I've narrated, the Weird Darkness store, links to my social media, and more. And if you listen to the podcast at the office, be sure to check out the Weird at Work page. Starting in October, your business might get a shout-out in a future episode, and maybe even get a delivery of something weird and or dark from me at your office. And now, let's step into the chamber. Here in the Chamber of Comments, I answer your emails, comments, podcast reviews, tweets, letters I get in the mail, and more. If you want to email me, you can do so at darren at weirddarkness.com. I received a comment from Arian Fawn saying, Hey Darren, I was just curious, when are you going to put Weird Darkness on Spotify and have an app for this podcast? I think it'd be really awesome for everybody to download the app so we as your weirdo family can make it easier. Also, I just want to say I'm really excited for next month. I never wanted to tell my side of enjoying this podcast because I'm still battling my depression. It's been a real struggle ever since I can remember. I think it's hard for me as a person to struggle with this illness, coping and pretending that I'm fine at work. I've been keeping this thought since I started listening to your podcast, and you have been helping me to get help myself. It's been hard for me to come out with this message to you personally because you gave me a purpose to enjoy something and to live my life as well. So thank you very much, Darren, for giving me purpose back and the reason to live. God bless. Well, thank you, uh, Arian. I'm looking forward to October as well. It's always a fun month for anything horror or creepy, just simply because it's Halloween month. And I'm also glad that you find some relief from your depression by listening to Weird Darkness. That really did feel good to read that. Uh, As for your question about Spotify, we should be there. Uh, you should be able to get Weird Darkness on Spotify. I don't know why you're not. I'm not a Spotify user, so I'm not really positive about that. Uh, but my podcast provider uh, did, ass- did assure me that, yes, it is up there. Um, and they sent me a link to the show on Spotify that I have put up on the website. So if you go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on the Spotify logo, that should take you to Weird Darkness on Spotify. At least I hope it does. Give it a try and let me know how it works for you. I got a comment from Gina Milligan regarding the episode The Last Mystery of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, part of that episode talks about reading or studying dark and occult materials and being negatively influenced by them. Gina says, This really does happen. I know. It's not just a story I heard about my friend's cousin, best friend's neighbor's gardener's godson. It's something that I actually experienced. And it is a long, terrifying tale I will not only never tell, but will also never let myself think about in any focused way. I know that anything, the slightest slip, can invite it all back again. And for the record, wasn't reading about occultism or the like. I was scouring the internet to find out what I saw in my bedroom one night as a child. A scary, mean, wiry little creature who took glee in jumping out at me, painfully knocking the wind out of me. I was simply reading the stories of others who've had encounters with mean entities. My best advice? Don't dig. You'll absolutely invite something to climb up from the hole and introduce itself. 
Note, I am a minister. I like to say my faith is all denominational because I've studied and continue to study all faiths, but my seminary training was biblical and have never played around with the darkness. I can attest firsthand that all of the Bibles, crucifixes, prayers, St. Benedict medallions, and sage and other anti-boogeyman items and practices in the world will not deter those nasty things from coming to you, and it'll take nothing short of literal divine intervention to make them go away. Tread carefully, my friends. May you be blessed with the loving protection of the Lord through all the days of your life. Signed, Gina. Thank you, Gina. You're, you're actually lending more weight to the warnings that I've given people. You can enjoy scary stories, movies, and podcasts, but never attempt to step into the paranormal personally. Nothing good is ever going to come from it. Got an email from Scott Lloyd. He said, Hi, Darren. I just want to say, as a new Weird Darkness listener, I appreciate your regular addressing of depression and anxiety. I think your podcast serves as an incredible resource for people who may be suffering from these issues. I myself deal with these problems daily, and I just find it so reassuring that you've created a venue that can be used as an outlet for others with these problems. Please don't stop, even if you do not feel that you're creating any benefit for other people, because you are. You are. You have such a cool, unique podcast, and I listen to a lot of podcasts. You also have a great voice. I'll be checking out the audiobooks that you have contributed to, and you can anticipate that I'll be purchasing many of them because of you. Thanks again, signed, Scott. Well, thank you for the email, Scott. Uh, I, no, no worries. I do not have any plans of stopping in the near future, so don't worry about that. Uh, by the way, this, is a, this email is a great way to remind everybody, next month is our anniversary month, uh, and in, uh, every, every October... I take an opportunity to raise funds for depression awareness and also overcoming it. So next month is Overcoming the Darkness, and I'll be taking the entire month asking you to join me to battle against depression. And well, we'll give you more details on that as we get closer, but if you do want a sneak peek about Overcoming the Darkness, uh, you can find it by clicking on Overcoming the Darkness at WeirdDarkness.com. And also we'll be uh, ending the month with our live screen, which was a big hit last year. Everybody really seemed to like it after the fact. <laughs> Not so many were able to watch it during the actual event because it takes place during trick-or-treat hours, but I had a lot of people come back afterwards and watch it and said they really enjoyed it. So uh, we will be doing that again this year. I'm not sure if it's going to be YouTube or Facebook that we'll be doing the live video on. Not really sure. If you have a preference, uh, drop me an email and let me know which way you think uh, it would work better. And then I got an email from uh, Rebecca Clark. She said, Hi, Darren. I listen to your podcast all the time at work, and I love it. Some of the stories have reminded me of my own experiences. One story I listened to today, I don't remember the episode name, was about a couple that heard music in TV stations when they turned a fan on. Well, that one part reminded me in the Amityville story where they heard the orchestra tuning up and eventually heard it coming up their staircase. I would love to hear you narrate that story. If you could please consider it, that would be amazing. Signed, Rebecca, a fellow weirdo at work. Well, uh, thank you for the email, Rebecca. I assume that when you sign that weirdo at work, that you've already filled out the weird at work form on the website. At least I hope so. So pretty good timing, too, because I do start the giveaways for that next month. Uh, I appreciate the kind words. I, 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 uh, I'm glad that you're loving the podcast, but when it comes to that Amityville story, I have touched on Amityville a couple of times in the past. I don't know specifically about the orchestra coming up the stairs thing. I, not that I, I'm not going to say that I didn't add that into the story. I just don't remember. I, I've done so many of these. But if you do want to hear the episodes where I did touch on Amityville, uh, you can just do a search for Amityville, all one word, Amityville. Um, and uh, you can do that on the website. And I think there's like 10 episodes at least that I've mentioned Amityville. So you got a lot of material there to, uh, to pour through if you're interested in that. And uh, also I got an email from Mrs. Sturgis. Uh, she's commenting about the episode Area 51 Killed My Husband. She said, hey, it's Paul Sturgis's wife. <laughs> and I love Faxverse and Weird Darkness. Uh, by the way, before I go on with this uh, email... Uh, yes, I'm also the narrator for a YouTube channel called Factsverse, and so a lot of people uh, have made reference to that. It's not my channel. I don't own it. I, uh, you know, I don't uh, research the scripts or write them or anything like that. I'm just their, their voice guy, but a lot of people know me from there. 
and so sometimes they think it's mine. But anyway, I'll, I'll continue on here. Uh, Mrs. Sturgis says, I don't know if you remember me. Anyway, last week or so, you did a podcast on Area 51 about the chemicals they used there, paints, etc. Well, I was playing on my laptop on my paid server for Star Wars, and someone who also follows the podcast asked me if I heard it. I said yes, and we talked for a good hour about the cancer and all the hidden secrets. When I got off of work that night, walking home, I noticed some very strange black cats in the parking lot. I live in a very small city, like maybe 900 people, if that. Everybody knows everybody. Got home that night and I had an email from the server provider saying my server had been disconnected for violating laws. Money was refunded, and since then I have noticed odd people that I have never seen before, people following me at Walmart, adding me to Facebook, etc., while I'm at work, and the phone rings, and when I answer they hang up. I even went as far as having the Royal Canadian Mounted Police do a background check, told them I have a new job and need it done. It came back clean, very odd, and ever since I talked about Area 51, this has been happening. Just thought I'd let you know and keep an open eye. Love you. <laughs> Yikes. Okay, Mrs. Sturgis, uh, yeah, I always assumed that the government spying and the men in black stuff, that was all just urban legends and conspiracy theories. Fun to read and talk about, but not real. But, well, now I have to wonder about that. With the big raid on Area 51 uh, now being over, hopefully your creepy, suspicious followers will also disappear. I hope. I had a lot of stuff here in the uh, Chamber of Comments today, but I was gone for two weeks, so I had a little catching up to do. Hope that was okay. I'll answer more of your emails, comments, and more next time, and I'll keep it a quite a bit shorter. You can find all my social media on the website, and you can find my physical mailing address on the contact page if you want to drop me something into the postal mail, or you can just drop me an email directly at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N, darren at weirddarkness.com. stories in this episode are purported to be true, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Stakini Vampire, Legends of the Coyote, Wendigo the Native American Cannibal, and Glooscap the Demon Slayer were all written by A. Sutherland. White Giants was written by Trisha at Disclosed TV. The Legend of the Little Deer was written by Talia Lightbringer. More Native American lore was written by Eric Redding. And The Flying Head of the Iroquois, Shapeshifting Thunderbirds, The Skeleton Man of the Hopi, Piazza, the Native American Dragon, The Moon-Eyed People of the Cherokee, and The Dark Watchers were all written by Ellen Lloyd, and A. Sutherland also contributed to Shapeshifting Thunderbirds. Weird Darkness Theme by Manuel Marino Weird Darkness is a registered trademark of Marlar House Productions, copyright Marlar House Productions 2019. And if you or your company are ever in need of a professional voice guy, well, why don't you talk to me about your project? I'd love to talk to you, and maybe we can work together. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And a final thought from Bryant H. McGill. There is no love without forgiveness, and there is no forgiveness without love. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>